Well, welcome. Thank you all for joining today's ASVMR member spotlight session. This is a series that was implemented by the ASVMR, <clears throat> excuse me, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. And the monthly series aims to highlight the research of ASVMR members within a collaborative setting and aims in particular to shine a light on the research being done by ASVMR members belonging to groups historically underrepresented in biomedical research. Today's spotlight, um, which is August uh, 25th, not July 28th, um, we'll have two presenters. First up, we have Dr. Marco Brodo, Hazel J. Endowed Professor and Director of Bone Muscle Research Center at the University of Austin, or <clears throat> excuse me, University of Texas Arlington, will present on bone muscle crosstalk range from cell, animal to human models. And second, we have Charles Sherman, the University of California, San Francisco, who will present his research, which identifies physical defects behind functional losses of the LCN and explores through in silico modeling potential ways to restore stimulation to aged osteocyte networks. This is a reminder to our presenters and attendees. Each presentation will take approximately 20 to 25 minutes and following each presentation, there will be opportunity for open Q&A and discussion with the audience. Um, you can unmute yourself and ask questions verbally or use the chat function. And um, just please remember to keep yourself muted during the presentations, but feel free to ask questions using the chat feature during each presentation. Um, and the session will be recorded and the recording will be on the ASBMR YouTube channel if anyone would like to go back and rewatch um, following the presentations. But at this point, I'd like to welcome Dr. Brodo to go ahead and begin his presentation. Thank you so much. This is, this is so wonderful. You know, we were just talking that it's summer, a lot of people traveling and all but I see that there is a, a, a good crowd of interested uh, folks you know, on, uh, on bone muscle crosstalk. Uh, thank you for the, the nice introduction and thank you for the ASBMR for this invitation, you know, for the spotlight. I'm, I'm also very pleased to be sharing you know, the, the spotlight with Charles today. So I'm going to uh, share my uh, my screen and bring you here my presentation. Uh, it's always it's it's never easy, you know. I I, I think to do this this kind of presentation. So what I really tried to do was, um, and I, I I'm always thinking about this, you know, that uh, what really what really connects us, you know, if you think of the great stories you read. They, they start with us up on a time, correct? They don't start, start with graphs. And so <laughs> what, what I'm going to try to do is really, and uh, the, the way I see is that the, the, the whole focus of this is collaboration. So I, I'm actually bringing much more, you know, the idea of collaboration, uh, then you know, heavy on data uh, today. Um, I, I'm also an, an entrepreneur, so I am the founding partner and chief scientific officer of Bioform uh, Sciences, which is the manufacturer of Muscle X, uh, a, a, a muscle cream. Uh, this is a thought, correct? Did not know the mission was impossible, so we went there and completed the mission. Um, I have had, you know, incredible mentors, uh, an amazing lab, a lot of support. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to be presenting today is this work that actually started with a, a grand opportunity. Uh, one of the R RC, you know, funding opportunities rolled over and we are now in our ninth year of funding. Uh, with Dr. Bonewald, uh, Dr. Dallas, Dr. Johnson, many of you know uh, him. I've been blessed by funding from uh, families that have funded you know, our enterprise. 
and also this incredible collaboration with the Shimatsu Institute. Uh, we are now in this amazing uh, new facility. These are the principal investigators along with me that have made you know, this dream come true of our emerging bone muscle research center uh, at UTA. Also in the first floor of our bone muscle research center, that is an incredible clinical and transformational center. Actually, we have our own parking spots you know, for the patients. This is led by Dr. Paul Fadel. These are the PIs of our you know, bone muscle research center. And we also have a CLIA and FDA accredited genome center in our facility, which is, is, is just incredible, you know, because that facilitates, of course, the uh, genetic, genomic, genomic analysis of clinical samples. We have a lot of capacity for, for functional uh, to all the way to the single muscle fiber uh, level. Uh, we have a lot of capacity for, for imaging, for muscle contractility experiments, of course, molecular genetics and uh, ultra-structural. Uh, some of these systems, uh, one of these systems is at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where we had started uh, some of this operation and part is still there. One part is now in our uh, center here uh, at UTA. I direct your attention to this back, you know, when we were, we were into three years or three, four years of these collaborations we put together a DVD on techniques in bone and, bo and, and muscle biology through the, the ASBMR, which I do believe is still available, where we show a lot of this work is by Dr. Leticia Broto herself, and where we show you know, in detail these muscle dissections, mounting, and how these experiments are performed. Uh, we also developed some really interesting approaches uh, for uh, flow cytometry of muscle cells and also focused approaches for uh, deciphering some of the mechanisms. Like I said, we have this North Texas Genome Center, which is really uh, a great facility. Excuse me, Marco. I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but your microphone is fading in and out. I don't know if anybody else is detecting that, or maybe it's just me. Um, don't know. It sounds good now. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll bring the, the whole system closer to me. Okay. Is it better? Yes, it's better now. I can, <clears throat> I can put this if you guys want. If it fails again, let me know and I, I'll put you know, the, the entire mic system. Okay, it sounds good so far. Okay. We also do a lot of uh, calcium imaging and actually you know, some of like Dr. Zui Pan and Dr. Uh, uh, Joe, they are, long-term, you know, experts in, in, in these in, uh, in our center. And then on the other hand of the spectrum, we have someone like Dr. Prisby on the bone studies and then biomaterials, immunologists. So, uh, and this, this is also something really interesting, you know, so this is something that we had started at UMKC which is exercise training, but expanding this to human studies. But now, as you see, we have extended to a number of facilities, including the National Institutes of Aging itself with Dr. Luigi Ferrucci. So we have a collaboration with the Creighton Osteoporosis Center, Tulane Center, Indiana University Genomics, Fit Core, and then now locally, with South Lake Hospital here in Texas. Uh, so 
this gives us this possibility of translating, you know, and we are also very, very interested in biomarkers. <clears throat> for the students, for the postdocs, look yearly. So available now, we have from 1990 to 2019, actually. Here I'm showing, you know, and you can actually scroll this in real time. And you see here musculoskeletal diseases as the fourth contributor of disease burden by cause. Two billion people affected, you know. This is tremendous, correct? I'm going to skip here. The global burden of disease view, viewed in this way sums up to a third of year lost for each person on the planet in 2017. Imagine that. Each of us lost a third of a year because of the burden of, of disease. And so, and musculoskeletal disease is when you actually transform life lost due to disability, it usually ranks number one. And 54% of Americans 18 and older, now this comes to 139 million Americans have at least one musculoskeletal condition. Why I'm doing this? I want to show how impactful our research can be, you know, and, and also give you good material, you know, for your significance in your grants, in your projects. We've been very interested in this concept of bone muscle uh, crosstalk beyond the, the physical interaction. And we believe that it happens from the cellular to the tissue to the organ to the system level. And actually, I believe that we've been helping to fill some of these blanks, you know. I, I have, because I have also training in pharmacology, you know, I'm always very interested in receptor sensitivity modulation and priming effect. What does one factor do to the next, correct? Does it prepare, does it prime for the next? And I've been very interested if muscles load bones and you know accrue you accrue muscle bone mass because of muscle, what is the opposite, correct? What is being secre secreted from bones that influences muscle? This is the, I call the dream team. <laughs> so Dr. Bonewald has led our PPG, Dr. S and she has been very interested in secreted factors from muscles that influence bone. She has honed in, in Biba, which is, uh, is a really interesting molecule that it was discovered from the diabetes field and we together have shown that it's actually secreted from even isolated muscles in a chamber, we can detect biba. And so it's really interesting. Dr. Dallas, she has been focused on exosomes, on vesicles, and maybe they are conduit, you know, for these uh, molecules. Dr. Mark Johnson, as you all know, has, has major contributions for the wind beta catenin signaling pathway, and he's been now focused on steroid regulation uh, of muscle and bone function. And Mike Wecker and I, we are, you know, the muscle uh, uh, biologists, and Mike also is a cardiovascular researcher. And so we sort of keep, you know, the muscle side, both at the University of Missouri and at the University of Texas. So a, a few years back, we started doing these sort of condition media experiments. And what we noticed was that actually osteocyte condition media made more of certain molecules, for example, more PGE2, more WINTS, Specifically, we detected much more WINTRIA, much more PGE2, and they induced beta-catenin translocation to the nuclei 
oh, let me, let me make sure that my, my arrow is actually visible uh, to you all. Is my arrow visible now? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so that beta catenin translocates to the nuclei and see how large the myotubes became, you know. And then with Wintria, look at the effect of Wintria, correct? Very large myotubes were obtained. And then I'm going to, to show this here because we've been very interested in myogenesis. And usually we measure myogenesis and we get this very important index, which is called fusion index. But we, what we also started doing, which is a, a much more sophisticated way, is using live dynamic, dynamic imaging. Uh, and this is started in collaboration with Dr. Dallas. And now we are actually doing this uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a next generation of this actually in our center here in Texas, which is we are labeling these cells with different dyes, with different membrane dyes and different organelles. But you can see that the cells went to proliferation can even see the nuclei inside this large myotube here, and they go on, you know, to form these very large. This this video always amazes me, you know, that this is happening in a time course of four days. Um, so this this is why I said, you know, that this presentation is to stimulate collaboration, but also show. So you see, we had, we had these cell models, correct? But then we collaborated with the Creighton Osteoporosis Center. I'm sorry, sorry to miss it here. And so Dr. Eckerd and Dr. Latte, the directors of the Creighton Osteoporosis Center. And you see here that when TRIA, look at the drastic reduction as, these women became older, no fracture, but now older with fracture, correct? So these are, you know, a, a magnitude and now, you know, another order of magnitude. And this is the control. Now here, the osteoporotic serum, and now, you know, the healthy serum. So you see how thin these myotubes are, you know, and actually we did here the quantification and the health serum actually promotes a myogenesis. And then what we did, we actually look at some of these markers. And really interesting is that we identify two, one upstream and one downstream uh, regulators of the wind beta catenin pathway FH1 and NUM. Now you see how these things loop into one another is that NUM actually expression reduces with aging. And we have a separate project actually that we've been funded by the National Institute of, of Aging that we have, we have in a, a model that we have created because of this that we are actually looking very closely at this because the animal model that lacks in a muscle specific manner, this gene actually develops accelerated aging or muscle aging. So you see, this is really interesting, correct? So we are now actually studying in detail, systematic way, mouse models, bone and muscle specific for beta catenin deletion in bone and muscle and Wintria deletion in bone and muscle. Now, really interesting is always to look that other, other labs are supporting your evidence, correct? Row of Wint beta catenin signaling rejuvenating myogenic differentiation of aged mesenchymal stem, stem cells. This group also found that Wintria reduces with aging in humans. 
And so showing the relevance of what we are finding, right? And activation of WinTRA provokes myogenic differentiation of stem cells in MDX mice. And then recently, the loss of WIN16 in two models of zebrafish. So very closely related WIN16 and WinTRA. And this one we are proposing that it's pleiotropic for bone and muscle. Treatment of PG2. This is really, really this large increase. And this was contrary actually to some of the data in human. And it's really interesting to see here, you start seeing a decrease. Later, we ran additional experiments. And if you go much higher, actually, it starts to decrease this. What happened in the human field was that the experiments started with 20 micromolar. So it shows also the importance of running those response curves with these experiments. And then what we also saw is that PG2 is able to increase submaximal force of muscle fibers. And this is shown, but not of old muscles. This is so something seems lost in those old muscles. Uh, one thing that it's interesting that we showed before is that if you put osteocyte condition media or PG2, you will start seeing these calcium oscillations. Now, if you knock down COX, you also see these calcium oscillations. So what we started seeing now in our core under the supervision of, of Dr. Zui Pan is we started doing this under confocal conditions. And this is only two hours treatment. And we started seeing these, really these flashes. And so as if PG2 is inducing very quick changes. And so we think that this maybe is part of the changes that actually induces the genetic changes or the gene changes that now are going to promote some of the differentiation changes. I can go on and on and on, correct? Why lipids are important precursor of hormones, cellular signals, the skeleton is metabolically active, you know, lipids in bones, not only in bone marrow, uh, remodeling requires cellular ba balance between adipocytes, osteoblasts. And so th th there, th there is a, a host of reasons. Uh, but beyond that, we are very interested in lipid signaling mediators. These are very potent bio biological active molecules. They are activators of PPARs, but I'm going to, to tell you all something very important. These are activators or repressors of chromatin. So there is a whole new field of lipid signaling that has been revealed, which is epigenetic changes induced by lipids, which I personally believe is one of the next frontiers. So they are regulators of age DAX. So this is really important. So we develop these new methods, you know, which are actually FDA sort of, we followed FDA guidelines basically. So they are FDA, you know, guideline based or approved because we wanted them to have validity you know, for clinical samples. And <clears throat> so we have 87 lipid mediators from the AA pathway, EPAs, DHA, LA, and EA pathway. And we can quantify all these 31 lipid mediators. 
So we quickly apply this to aging. And I want you to, fo to focus you guys' attention for PGE2. This is the first time actually that PGE2 was actually quantified, absolute quantification in young and age, and actually showed the opposite of you know, the data that we thought. So actually reduces with aging. So our data that you put in a little bit more of PGE2 or that maybe some PGE2 coming from bone it stimulates myogenesis, we do think it makes a lot of sense. Then another, another set that it was really interesting, and this is run at the University of Missouri by Dr. Mike Wecker, coordinate this with Dr. Johnson, Dr. Dallas there, and then we get the samples, is that you see there, many of these lipid mediators are actually reduced, correct, compared to the young. The young is the black, you see here the sedentary, and then actually, there is a rescue when you exercise the animals. So this idea that lipids are intrinsically inflammatory, maybe it's incorrect, maybe it's not correct. And then we are finding very important correlations in our clinical studies. Some, some background noise. <laughs> There's some background noise. I think, do, do I still have time? Yeah, sure, keep going, go ahead. Um, and I was able to mute some of the feedback that was coming through, so. Okay. Keep an eye on that. Uh, so from these studies, there is something that was revealed that it was really interesting which was in gastronomies from animals that these animals, they were in voluntary wheel running for six months. So at 12 months, they, 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 they had their own running wheel. They, they, they usually you know, run, they start, they stabilize like three, four kilometers you know, per day. And this, 11, 12 EET, you know, in the control was high, and then it reduced in diaphragm. And remember, it's very important to measure, to quantify things in the diaphragm because of its physiological importance, also reduced. And then what we did is we also compared to BIBA. Because remember, Dr. Bonewall has the whole, the whole data, you know, with BIBA that BIBA improves uh, muscle function, preserves uh, bone, you know, when you unload uh, animals, when you unload muscles, and you see that VWR and then BIBA also uh, have this effect. So in collaboration with the lab of Dr. David Karaski, we created using CRISPR, we created a Shreb F1. This is a pleiotropic gene for bone and muscle. And we got an osteoporotic phenotype, so reduced BMD. And this is really interesting, correct? Because the control, the wild type, has the least amount of this lipid, this 11-12-EET. So it's almost as if, if you have a bad situation, correct? If you lack Shreb F1, which is a major regulator of cholesterol, or if you are sedentary, you have a lot of this lipid. So it's really revealing a new function of this lipid. So we are very, very interested, you know, in the modulation and now looking for new ways 
and new pathways to inhibit. And we think that perhaps one of the ways, like I said, is going to be also to age tax. So this is sort of putting, you know, all together. Now, even more interesting is that when we took the serum from humans, from our fit core exercise group from Indiana, we also found this negative correlation between this specific lipid and male and female you know, activities and some of their performance. So again, supporting this idea that this lipid actually needs to be, you know, in, uh, in reduced levels, correct? For optimal function or sort of a biomarker of a performance. Now, really interesting is the lab of Dr. Blau really beautiful study. They recently injected uh, PGE2 or a formulation of PGE2 and in, in a model of muscle regeneration and they saw improved muscle recovery. And so also providing strong support for these studies. And so we think that our lipidomics studies they are revealing very important you know, functions of these lipid medi mediators that very have these cellular pathological you know, functions, insulin, muscle, and then wound healing. Uh, and really it's this fine balance, but we think that this combination of cellular animal models and human, we can, design, you know, better uh, experiments. I want to give one last example. Dr. Bonewald Group led this study where she showed in an animal model that L. biba was protective, was an osteocyte survival factor. This was a very detailed study. There is even a mechanism that it was proposed uh, that biba works as an antioxidant factor. And what we did, we developed for the first time a metabolic, metabolomics method in our center here at UTA. And look, we were able to show a very strong association in humans of bone mineral density and Biba levels. Again, that application of, you know, of what you are seeing in animals with these human studies. So to summarize, I think that, you know, I hope that I have inspired you a little bit, you know, to see that crosstalk happens or is happening, you know, from these different levels and really it takes a lot of collaborators, you know, it takes collaboration and it takes experiments at many, many levels, you know, uh, to come to these uh, conclusions. And I think that there is uh, much, much more to come, you know, in the field of bone muscle crosstalk. And so I'm open now to uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brodo. Um, so I have a question for you. One thing that I've always been interested in, in when you talk about this muscle bone crosstalk, do you find a difference? So if you think about the orientation of the muscle around the bone or close to the bone surface, I know in your lab, you have the capability of doing the single muscle fiber functional test. Have you looked at how the bone cross talks with the muscle in terms of does it diffuse into the muscle or vice versa or does it travel through the circulation i was wondering if you took a isolated 
muscle fiber that was close to the bone surface and compared the functional properties to say a muscle fiber deeper and further away from the bone surface, would there be a difference in crosstalk in this communication between the two, and which would potentially influence the function of the fiber? And that's a, that's a, a, really, a, a really wonderful question. What, what we know is that when, when we dissect, you know, uh, entire anatomical muscle, so layers and EDL, correct, for example, uh, which are the muscles we have tested. And if, if they are just aesthetic in the chamber and we collect the media, we cannot, we really don't detect much of these metabolites. But when we start contracting them, when we stimulate them electrically, then we start detecting these metabolites in the condition we do. And so we do know that it's, you know, electrically that it's activity, it's contraction induced. Now, when you think of, you know, the uh, original studies uh, from Peterson, uh, when she identified a specific IL-6 deriving from, from muscles of humans, uh, actually, uh, she actually clamped, correct, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the humans localized, you know, capillaries, and she was collecting very near uh, to the muscles. And that's how she was able to distinguish, you know, uh, the IL-6 from, you know, the overall circulation. Now, of course, you could argue, you know, now we know that skeletal muscles also have immune, immune cells, which of course adds another layer, you know, so there, there may be additional cells that could be contributing to the crosstalk within a tissue itself, you know, uh, to, to, the, to the question, you know, the, 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 there was a, a, a beautiful study, uh, I believe it was, published, it was published in the ASBMR or, or Biophysical Journal. So the group, what they, they did, they used dyes of different sizes and then they had sort of a periosteum layer and they saw the diffusion mm. through that layer, just natural you know, uh, the diffusion. There are also the classical studies of injecting the tail vein, correct, uh, with dyes. And so we know that molecules, even molecules of relatively large molecular weight can diffuse, you know, through uh, the circulation. We also know that hormones, correct, can, can circulate. And so, so certainly it's, it's, it's not, you know, uh, an easy question, but for example, molecules like PG2 and BIBA, these are not very large molecules, correct? And so probably, you know, uh, it would not be very hard for them to be secreted, you know, from the nearby periosteum and reach, you know, uh, the muscle cells. Now, whether they reach the entire muscles or just part of the muscles, uh, it's, it's a very good question. Thank you. In the interest of time, um, I'd like to go ahead and invite um, Charles Sherman to begin his presentation and then at the end, um, if there are more questions, we can circle back, but I just wanna make sure that Charles has plenty of time to give his presentation if that's okay with um, you guys. Um, Charles, please feel free to go ahead and share your screen and begin your presentation. Thank you again. All right, thank you. Um, and thank you for a wonderful presentation, Professor Brado. Um, let me pull these up. Everybody can see the title screen, great. Um, so I want to thank um, ASBMR and the Member Spotlight Committee for uh, inviting me to come speak. It's a great honor. Um, I am Charles Sherman. I am a graduate student in the lab of Tamara Allison at UCSF in the bioengineering department. Um, so contrary to as advertised, not yet a doctorate, but will be 
graduating in December, so looking for postdocs, so for people that are interested. Um, and so the title of the talk is Disrupted Osteocyte Connectivity and Pericellular Fluid Flow in Bone with Aging and Defective TGF-beta Signaling. And I want to take a second to just send a shout out and a thank you to our wonderful collaborators, Stefan Verbrungen, who helped out a lot with this work. These are our funding sources. We don't have any um, disclosures to make. So first we'll start with um, talking about osteocytes and the importance of the osteocyte lacunar canalicular network. Um, this is an osteocyte talk. Um, so osteocytes are internal bone cells that reside within the lacunar canalicular network, which is a series of cavities and channels that exist with inside the bone itself. Within this network, the osteocytes have a combined surface area of around 200 square meters. And if you were to line them up end to end, it would be reach over 175,000 kilometers in length. And for reference, um, the largest or longest organ system in the body is the nervous system, which maxes out around 1,800 kilometers. So these two systems are very, very comparable in that regard. And osteocytes themselves comprise over 90 to 95% of all bone cells. Functions of the osteocytes include the coordination of the activity of osteoblasts and osteoclasts through secreted factors such as fluorostin, OPG, and rank ligand. They provide internal access to bone nutrients by connecting to the vasculature because the internal compartments of bone are avascular. Um, osteocytes maintain local bone strength through a process known as perilacunar canalicular remodeling, or PLR, um, through which a series of secreted factors remodel their local surroundings. And osteocytes also act as sensory network to feel the mechanical loading of bones via the motion of pericellular fluid flow between the cell surface and the mineralized walls of the LCN themselves. I'm going to jump over to our second topic, which is skeletal aging, um, which we know is marked as a progressive loss of function in our tissue. And when we think of the bone cells, the different classes of bone cells and their functions in this process, the roles of osteoblasts and osteoclasts are relatively well known to lead to decreases in bone mass. But the functions of osteocytes are not as well understood. However, there are several um, aspects of skeletal aging that are linked to osteocyte function such as an increases of bone fragility or low bone quality without losses to bone mass, diminished mechanosensitivity in aged bone, as well as a direct um, degeneration of the osteocyte lacunar canalicular network itself. Given these aspects of skeletal aging that are tied to osteocyte function, we can ask the question, is skeletal aging also a progressive loss of osteocyte function? When we think of osteocyte function, we need to also think of the things or the molecular pathways that control osteocyte function. Our lab has previously um, established the link between TGF-beta or transforming growth factor beta and its role in the general skeleton. But the question remained, how does it relate to osteocyte activity specifically? We generated a model of interrupted TGF-beta signaling specifically in osteocytes through the dmp one Cree um, t beta r flux model, which we'll be calling t beta r 2 these mice um, exhibit a loss of enzymes involved in paralacunary remodeling, including MMPs and other matrix remodeling enzymes. They exhibit losses to bone strength, including a loss of work to fracture and a notch bending test, as well as exhibiting losses to osteocyte um, lacunar canalicular networks marked by losses of 2D canalicular length in silver nitrate staining. So we have several aspects of uh, bone aging that are also marked by osteocyte intrinsic losses to TGF-beta signaling. What about mechanosensitivity? And another model of degenerate or lost TGF-beta signaling through um, a dominant negative type two receptor, we see a loss of mineral opposition rate after loading. Given these similarities between systemic aging and osteocyte losses to TGF-beta signaling, we can ask the question, at what level are these two processes, aging and TGF-beta signaling, through the lacunar canalicular network or osteocyte health related systemically to bone health. One of the first things we did when we started looking at this was to actually look at the gene expression of aged mice um, and using a, um, an mRNA transcript array um, from osteocyte enriched uh, cortical bone, which is marrow spun periosteum stripped cortical bone. We were able to see losses to both ECM synthesis and degradation pathways, as well as matrix remodeling enzymes including MMP13. Now this is very similar to the gene expression we saw from our TBIT R2 mice previously, 
where we saw losses to the PLR sweep of matrix remodeling enzymes. We were also able to look at um, the TGF beta signaling pathway in the aged mice. And when we look at this systemically, we can see that aged mice have a systemic loss of activity within the TGF beta signaling pathway, including uh, molecular transducers, including the SMAD proteins, as well as an increase of the agonists of the pathway, including TNF. When we compare this to the same regulation of the TGF beta signaling pathway in the TBeta R2 mice, we saw that the only similarly regulated um, gene was actually TGF beta receptor type 2, the specific molecule we have knocked out in these mice. When we look at um, a phenotypic similarity between these two mouse models, Using silver nitrate stating in 2D, we see a loss of canalicular length in the aged mice that is mirrored by the loss that we previously saw in the TBR2 model. Given these similarities, we generated the hypothesis that lacunar canalicular degeneration, either due through systemic aging or osteocyte intrinsic defects to TGF beta signaling, is sufficient to compromise osteoage functions that support bone health. We wanted to interrogate this through a series of questions. Um, um, including 3D phenotyping, and then assaying other functions of osteocytes, including mass transport and mechanosensitivity. And we'll do this through a series of tools, including fluorescent confocal microscopy, and then some computer-aided analysis, um, connectomics network analysis, and finite element analysis fluid dynamics. I'm breaking those in silico tools down a little bit, um, just to give you some frame, we'll, we'll walk through several different ways we use these tools, including a nodal analysis, pathway analysis, and then finally asking questions about diffusion. And then in finite element analysis, we can look at single cell morphology. We can change aspects of the cellular environment, including changing the pericellular space. And then finally, do some actual fluid modeling. So starting off with our confocal microscopy, we can see that in 3D, there's these very, very fantastic intricate networks that we're able to capture, but we can also see these intense degenerations in our aged wild type mice, as well as the TBAT R2 knockouts. So this lets us ask these questions when we have these 3D models that are unavailable to our 2D analyses, where we can really ask functional approaches or functional outcomes, often as because the engineering kind of cliche that structure equals function. When we first look at these, just a different representation here, these are Z projections of stacks, so you can more cleanly see the differences here. Some of the parameters that we were able to look at include canalicular tortuosity, which is the bending of the canalicular path from its end from one cell to another. Previously, this is what we had been seeing in 2D as shortened canalicular length as the osteocyte projection dips in and out of our focal planes in our histological approaches. And this is increased in uh, these degenerated models. We're also able to assay as canaliculi for osteocyte in 3D, which shows again reductions in our models. And then we can actually count osteocyte cell bodies, which interestingly, we only saw losses in the aging models. And this is um, consistent with previous analyses of the TBR2 mice that don't show losses to osteocyte cell bodies. So these degenerated networks specifically are characterized by a loss of canaliculi and increased local canalicular tortuosity, which again, this was previously understood as canalicular length in 2D. So the important question then becomes, are there functional implications to changes in these, in these geometries? So when we have these features, we can now use these 3D models to ask those functional questions. And first we'll start off with connectomics. So what is connectomics? So it is most easily understood as an application of a nodal network, which is a collection of nodes or points connected to each other by a series of connection known as edges. So this is a mathematical map that is used to ask mathematical questions. And we can apply this to the osteocyte network as we understand the nodes to be interactions between canaliculi and cell bodies or themselves and the canaliculi themselves are the edges in our map. So this approach based on graph theory allows us to ask classifying whole comparative network value questions, which is important because these kinds of analyses are not biased by user selections such as previous um, phenotypical scoring methods such as tortuosity or canalicular length or wherever user bias is introduced. 
when we first started this analysis, the most striking was the number of nodes being decreased in our generated models, signifying that there's a loss of candelicular interaction in both the aged and the TBR2 models. Interestingly, both of the degenerated models showed increases to endpoint nodes or nodes that represent terminal positions of canaliculi that represent non-functional paths within the network. However, overall, the, the network type and architecture was maintained, but it is primarily these canalicular behaviors and connections that are unchanged. And we call this behavior canalicular pruning, which reduces the known number and in 10 compromises the integrity. One of the other questions we wanted to ask is, are there intervening changes between the sprouting point and the point where these paths do not terminate? What is the behavior of the, the network in between these regions? So we were able to look at osteocyte canalicular branching starting from the sprouting point using our high resolution confocal images. And here we saw at the initial sprouting point, a loss of canalicular number at the base, which was previously established in our other analyses. But when we step our way into the network and move forward, we're able to see that the canaliculi are branching at the same rate in all of the models analyzed, such that canalicular behavior itself is not affected, or at least this specific aspect of canalicular behavior is not affected. And this also extends as we move further and further into the matrix. So we know that there's an internal network architecture that is unchanged, but how does this network pruning impact function? So one of the other tools we use that Connectomics allows us to do is an analysis that's known as betweenness centrality. So betweenness centrality is a mathematical concept that assigns a, a value to every individual node within the network based on the number of paths in the network that run through that node. So then the more paths that go from one end to another that use a node, the higher that value becomes. And so that ends up looking sort of like this, where in our healthy networks or our young control networks, we have a large amount of nodes that are bluish. These are the lower scoring nodes. So we have a higher amount of nodes that score lower. So there's more paths and they're used less often. When we compare those to our degenerated um, networks, we start to see an increase in the number of higher scoring red, green, yellow type nodes, and as well as a loss of those low scoring blue nodes. One way we like to compare this is sort of like a roadmap through the network, where in our younger models or our healthy models, it's like a, a suburban city map where you have lots of different ways to go from one end to another, where our degenerated models are more like an area where there's very few options for traffic to go through. So you get congestion in these areas. And what ends up happening is we lose diffusive ability in these networks possibly because of these losses to canalicular paths. Um, so these degenerated networks have fewer canalicular paths that inhibit diffusive ability. Um, this is an example of these 3D connectomes in their entirety to give you an idea of the analysis that's going on here. So the left is the skeletonized osteocyte network with the kind of segmented nodes um, overlaid. And on the right was the whole node, nodal map that has somewhere between 18 to 20,000 nodes. So you can appreciate how dense this analysis is. So this diffusive loss that we've discussed earlier, um, again, is a mathematical um, approach we can use given these nodal maps and is uh, primarily a result of a loss of canalicular density within these networks that increases the distance from any point in the matrix to the network so the path length is longer there because we have less canalicular um, path choice availability and not so much other um, aspects of the network that, is, are, that are also measured, including paths from every can, um, canaliculi to the cell or other aspects. So this is driven primarily by a loss of the canalicular density. So moving to our other tool, um, when we wanted to talk and think about other aspects of osteocyte function, including mechanosensitivity, we'll use finite element analysis to ask these questions. So our first step is generating cellular meshes around our uh, confocal images. And we were able to segment out single cells from our confocal analysis and build these triangular meshes, these stereotypical finite element meshes around our, our um, cells. 
From here, in order to um, model fluid flow, we needed to construct a pericellular space or that region in which the fluid flow is actually occurring. And so this is that region between the cell surface and the mineralized wall of the LCN that we had to um, uh, create within the computer. And we were able to use distances from uh, several TEM studies to set a baseline value that is able to actually tell us the, the average value of distance. And it's about um, 0 0.08 microns thick or 80 nanometers. So in our base cases, in our aged models, we see a loss of fluid flow include, um, and also then a loss of associated shear stress in our aged models that is again mirrored in the TGF beta deficiency model. Again, showing a similar loss of function in this assay between the two models. Interestingly, we were able to see these localized hotspots where we saw increases to fluid flow in the canaliculi. So we asked the question, are these, is this a way, this increase in canalicular tortuosity, is this a mechanism by which these cells are trying to recapture some of their lost fluid uh, interaction? So are we able to segment out individual canaliculi from our models across a range of tortuosity values within um, the systems we saw? And we were surprised to find that this increasing canaliculi or tortuosity in the canaliculi does not overwhelmingly influence flow. So we did ask the other question then, what are other parameters of the LCN that can modulate flow? Well, one of the other functions of osteocytes that we previously discussed is this activity of perilacuna remodeling in which they're able to resorb or remodel their surrounding space. And so we thought, can we leverage this behavior and how does this possibly influence flow? So we were able to take our pericellular models and change the width of these to kind of mimic either a loss of this remodeling or a, um, an increase in this behavior. And we were able to change these values without changing the osteocyte surface area underlying all of the models as sort of our control case. And we we're able to see is obviously when we change the thickness of these spaces, we can change the overall volume of the systems that we're using flow. One of the interesting things though, is when we compare the base case, for example, in the T beta R2 control to the knockout, we have a loss of about 60% of the volume. But when we double that space, we can recreate or recapture that volume. So the, the changing of these uh, thicknesses can kind of mirror the effects of our aging or, or loss of TGF beta signaling. So when we look at the flow in these areas, we can see in the constricted space, we still see these um, similar uh, relationships between our control and our um, degenerated models. And when we expand this, we see an increase overall, but still a ma maintenance of this relationship between the models, because this is primarily, again, driven by osteocyte surface area. However, one of the interesting things is if we compare um, our original case, right, where in the control, we have a, an average of maybe two pascals versus the aged case where we have about half of that shear stress. When we look at the expanded models, um, the young case, we about double that. And again, we same relationship, we double that again in the aged when we double the volume. Now, interestingly, the original young type now has a comparable amount of shear stimulation as our expanded aged case. And these are in fact, non-significantly different from each other. So we can say, at least in the computer, that losses to osteocyte mechanical sensation are physically recoverable. So overall, some um, main points. Um, osteocyte intrinsic defects to TGF beta signaling can recapitulate an aged bone canalicular phenotype. Network mapping identifies local canalicular pruning in the compromised lacunar canalicular networks. Our encilical tools are able to identify defects to both mass transport and mechanostimulation through fluid flow shear stress. And that losses to mechanostimulation at least physically are recoverable by expanding the PCS volume around these osteocytes. Um, I want to thank all the members of the, er, <laughs> of the Alliston Lab and especially our collaborator Stefan Verbrungen um, as well as my graduate program and the UCS Department of Orthopedic Surgery, um, and of course our funding sources.
Um, thank you guys for your time and the opportunity to speak with you guys. It's been uh, quite an honor. Great, thank you, Charles. At this point in time, um, let's open it up to questions. Um, like I said, feel, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or um, use the chat feature. Yes, I had a question. This is uh, Patrick Mulcron from Indiana University. How do the number of osteocytes in all of the different networks in your mouse models compare to one another? So when they age or you have the TGF beta 2 knockout, are the number of the osteocytes in the networks you're looking at, is that affected? Mm -hmm. So we uh, specifically made sure when we were doing our high resolution, the connectomic mapping to make sure that the numbers of osteocytes included in those analysis were held the same because we were trying to prioritize this canalicular analysis or this canalicular function question. So we made sure to maintain osteocyte number within all of those regions analyzed. And then the, the fluid flow dynamic modeling was all done on single cells um, so that they were one-to-one -one comparable. Yeah. Um, very nice presentation and interesting data. Um, so I had a question in regard to when you were looking at tortuosity and flow, and mm -hmm. you found that tortuosity did not influence the flow through the canalicular network. Um, and there are some other factors that contribute to flow or the resistance to blood flow. And the tortuosity would represent the resistance. Had you considered looking at differences in pressure? Um, so I know that in our lab, we're measuring intramedullary pressure inside bone, and we're seeing a difference, a lower pressure in older animals versus younger animals. So have you considered looking at pressure or, or introducing pressure as part of one of your variables? Yes. So pressure was one of our boundary conditions that we held constant in this analysis. So it is true that you'd have changes. You could have changes in, um, you know, uh, vascular pressure, or blood pressure that would change the pressure within the LCN. We did not change that in this analysis, um, but you're right, it could be very obviously changed. Um, one of the reasons we held it constant was because we were trying to look sort of at if we were to load the bones in a way that was um, similar or, or if they were to receive the same stimulus, would these osteocytes be able to feel a difference based on their, their channel geometry or their number of processes? But you're right, the, the, the interstitial pressure definitely would change this. Is, the, is there any way that you can keep the other parameters constant and change pressure and then see if there's a difference between your young and old or your knockout? Yeah, I, th I think it'd be very easy to just change the driving pressure in the model. And then we could include that as another variable. But um, at, at that point, we'd have to if we wanted to ask the, the specific pressure question, we'd probably want to use similar geometries just to ask that function first before introducing that additional complexity. Yes, that's definitely a, a thing. Because the length of the, the cannuliculi would make a difference as well as the diameter. Mm -hmm. but very nice work. Thank you. Okay, hey, well, if there aren't any other questions, um, I wanna thank both of our presenters again for two wonderful presentations. Um, and thank all the attendees for joining. Um, as a reminder, this is a monthly series, so be on the lookout for communications from ASBMR um, about the next session, and we hope to see you then. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.